wonderful things about your book is the way that it actually explodes the subject beyond just uh, just uh, literature and the arts. There is a way in which uh, this could really be a guide to what's happening in China, what has been going on in China, uh, in Chinese urbanization in the last 30 years. Right. Um, and I wonder if that was part of what you were trying to do. And um, You know, initially, the reason I uh, started writing about this topic is that I, um, my first experience in China was almost 20 years ago living in a much more rural part of China. And um, as I began to see as cities being built as rapidly as they were, and the associated lifestyles associ um, with with these cities changing so rapidly, I saw um, everyday life change around me in mm -hmm. China, and change really rapidly, and with it the associated cultural values. And um, given the size of China, its influence globally, um, I began to wonder about how will this cultural change impact um, impact both everyday life within China but also larger you know global uh, trends and so um, in the book I do try to situate these cultural aesthetics um, from the last 20 years in China within a broader economic and geopolitical movements what I found really important is the way in which the development of cities went hand in hand with a development or changes in the way that they were visualized, the way in which uh, cameras moving inside the cities not only recorded what was going on, which was very important mm -hmm. for me as well, because part of why, why I got interested in it had to do with the change, just the in which the city is disappearing and changing in front of your eyes, um, is one important part of it. But the other one is that the cameras moving around the city actually change the city too. They create a different way of understanding how we look at the city. So in, in in my book, I also talk about this dichotomy. It's not necessarily a dichotomy. It's a dynam dynamic between the city as a subject and the subject in the city. So in other words, an awareness on the part of individuals in the city that the city is taking on an identity. And in turn, this built environment, um, this built environment is being created by people who have a new relationship to space. Um, because of economic and material changes in terms of China's current development. And also, um, their, their own subjectivity, their own understanding of themselves, their individual identity, their relationship to space in terms of concepts of privacy, or who I am as a citizen, subject in that sense, begins to change in relation to um, the built environment. So these changes both um, build the environment, obviously, and in turn there's sort of a dynamic feedback loop where um, the built environment and the way the built environment is visualized through film, um, imagined in literature, represented in art, um, it in turn it, um, informs a sense of identity. And what is interesting for me is the way that many artists are aware, were well aware of this problem, right? right? So that they approach their art, they uh, go into making, say, a film with the idea of changing how people relate to the built environment. Absolutely. Uh, not to mention, of course, cases in which the government is uh, involved and is making a very clear move to use <coughs> film or theater to um, um, engineer a very specific kind of citizenship and, uh, and formulate the relationship between citizens and their environment, and how they see their environment, how they act in that environment. So the interesting thing, I think, in both of our projects is looking at this relationship between 
government um, slogans or discourse about the city and how it's interpreted or expressed or reproduced by artists, filmmakers, or in, I'm thinking about Shi Yong, a visual artist in Shanghai, who actually is playing with government slogans about how to mm. be a good Shanghainese, civil, civilized Shanghainese citizen. Um, what kind of new identity should the global Shanghainese citizen have? He, um, he's definitely using these kinds of slogans that are, are being um, propagated by the government, again, not in a pejorative sense, but in sort of an infor informing how to be a new urban citizen. He takes that and um, plays with it. And it's that kind of play in 1990s and 2000s arts that I find very interesting um, in terms of the way um, the way this urban discourse is being understood by everyday citizens. Well, I wanted to say something just about that because um, um, the, the question of how artists then take the official line and um, spoof it or, or uh, turn it toward their end um, is a especially interesting case, I think, especially in China because of its post-socialist condition, because uh, the slogans are there, the slogans are very visible, as you say, right? Mm -hmm. It is part of the urban visual field. And so um, when I talk, talk, for example, about Jia Zhangke's The World, mm -hmm. what is important for me is the way in which he takes the theme park as a way of talking about the city, because the city is just another form of theme park, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, a theme park built by the government, by the, usually the, or the municipal government. So I think what's interesting to ask is that as, as so many people have been asked the question, um, where is China moving? What kind of global impact will China's development have? I think what's interesting in looking at the history of the city um, and the way it has signified in Chinese culture um, is to say what's new about China today in the 21st century mm -hmm. in relation to its urban development and um, in, in what ways is this an extension of its more socialist period. For me, I, th I, I think that um, post-socialism carries with it all of the connotations of the post in the sense that there's a con continuity with socialism and there's also some sort of rupture ostensible rupture in what came before so that even though people talk about China in many senses as more of a capitalist economy today. Um, in another sense many of the structures of socialism continue such as um, the way information propaganda is communicated to people. Today it may be through urban models for example. Um, the way in which socialist monumentality or scale which even is an extension of the imperial era, continues today. Um, in terms of the scale of China's urban projects that, that, that astounds almost everybody who visits China today. So um, in some ways there's an interesting blending of um, a more global capitalist incentive for developing buildings in space. And on the other hand there's a um, there's something from the Chinese cultural heritage that continues today. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if I may venture to say something I'm just thinking of right now, um, <clears throat> you know, um, Lyotard says that the um, postmodern is a precondition to the modern. Mm -hmm. In a way, um, in what I've, in the cases I've looked at, you could say that the post-socialist is a precondition to the socialist mm -hmm. in the sense that there is an engineering or a uh, manipulation, a spoofing even, of, um, of what urban space means, how urban space is perceived, how uh, urban space is visualized uh, from the very beginning of the socialist state. Mm -hmm. um, and it is important to realize that there is always this give and take. How are we being seen? How are we seeing the city? Um, it's, it's always at the level of consciousness at the surface mm -hmm. level. Um, and the question is always, how do we 
how do we manipulate really the force conversation? Well, so so did I, and uh, and it, it's interesting the way this, the, the ways that our books speak to each other, and um, and I look forward to exploring this more. Thanks.